1921 revolution of Blair Mountain was a reaction to the collapsing coal industry and the brutality of the coal companies. It ultimately culminated in the deunionization of West Virginia and severely detrimental reforms within the UMWA, which would cripple the union for the rest of the decade. World War I ushered in an increased demand for coal. Coal production rose from 111 million tons in 1890 to 579 million tons by 1918. During the war, the total number of employed miners rose from 561,000 to 615,000. However, this growth was not to last. The demand for coal at the end of the war dropped nearly 60% with the loss of munitions markets in Europe. Competition from alternate fuel sources and the improved utilization of coal due to new technologies further harmed the industry. This was in stark contrast to the norm during the Roaring Twenties with the majority of industries experiencing growth. Burdened with a massive surplus, the coal companies began to cut wages, reducing the minimal gains negotiated by the United Mine Workers of America at the end of World War I. This further aggravated tensions between the miners and the operators. The roots of this revolution, in addition to the collapsing coal industry, lay in the brutal tyranny of the coal companies who used any means necessary to suppress the miners. One of the most important methods utilized was the payment of miners in scrip, a monetary system only accepted at the company-owned store. By forcing miners to buy from them, the companies were able to manipulate prices as they pleased, almost always forcing the miners into debt. The operators' tactics were not limited to scrip. The owners also used their own private security force to prevent unionization, instituted a bureaucratic form of rape known as Esau, planted spies to root out union miners, and even constructed their own company courthouses. Everything the operators did, right down to the design of the company's store, was meant to keep the miners in check. And as John L. Lewis of the UMWA so aptly puts it, arrogant and insolent gentlemen do not hesitate to suborn public officials in their communities, to police their communities with privately hired and armed gunmen, to evict our people from their homes, to cut off food supplies for our people and leave them to their mercy, to cut off water and electric light, and to cut off medical attention. And apparently, we have plenty of aid to give stricken peoples anywhere in the world except in the mining regions of this country. May 19, 1920, 13 Baldwinfeltz detectives arrived in the town of Matewan in Mingo County along the Kentucky-West Virginia border. The Baldwinfeltz Detective Agency regularly supplied the mine operators with men who served as mine guards, rapists, and all-around hired thugs, much like their Pinkerton doubles to the north. These particular agents were here to serve eviction notices. After illegally evicting the miners from their homes on the edge of town, the agents returned to the train station where Sid Hatfield, the chief of police, and the mayor of Matewan, Cable Testerman, confronted the agents. When Hatfield attempted to make a lawful arrest, the agents opened fire. Deputies and citizens responded, and in the ensuing chaos, ten people were killed, seven Feltz agents, and three citizens. Many West Virginia newspapers closely followed the trial of the shootout, and in the months following, Sid Hatfield became the embodiment of the Union's struggle, gaining respect and fame among the miners. In July of 1921, Sid Hatfield was charged with blowing up a coal tipple in Mohawk. His court appearance was set for the 1st of August in McDowell County. Awaiting his arrival at the McDowell County Courthouse were three Baldwin Feltz agents, Charles E. Lively, a Baldwin Feltz spy, Bill Saltier, a survivor of the Matewan Massacre, and George Pence, whose motto was shoot him with one gun and hand him another. When Hatfield reached the top of the steps, the three men opened fire, killing Hatfield. The next day, over 2,000 people turned out for Sid's funeral. Miners were angry, and some began to arm themselves, specifically after choice statements by the Sheriff of McDowell collaborating the agent's claim of self-defense. District 17 President Frank Keating, along with Treasurer and Secretary Fred Mooney, counseled the miners to patience. As the miners began to gather near Charleston in preparation for an armed march into the non-union coal fields of Logan County, Governor Morgan convinced the federal government to intervene. General Harry H. Bandeholtz was dispatched to Charleston on August 26th. There, Bandeholtz met with Governor Morgan, Keeney, and Mooney, and demanded Keeney and Mooney put an end to the uprising. The two, now backed by the federal government, reported having success in convincing the miners to disperse. Thus satisfied, Bandeholtz returned to Washington that same night. It appeared the march was over. However, the coal companies, using Logan County Sheriff Don Chaffin as their medium, would soon deliberately shatter this fragile peace during what became known as the Sharples Incident. On August 27th, 130 state troopers shot and killed five miners under the guise of serving arrest warrants. Outraged, the miners resumed their march with an even greater intensity than before, 
a result the companies had hoped for as it would provide legal grounds for the destruction of the UMWA. A later senatorial committee even found Chaffin guilty of reinciting the march and said, quote, The descent upon this town at night to serve these warrants could hardly have had any other effect than to start afresh to threaten trouble. Miners hijacked trains, raided stores for arms and munitions, and by August 29th, the battle was in full swing. Estimates placed the number of marching miners at anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 and even beyond. In response, Sheriff Chaffin mustered up a defending force of about 3,000 to 5,000. Although outnumbered, Chaffin's army had the higher ground and better weaponry, including planes armed with homemade bombs and several machine guns. The miners and the defenders engaged in sporadic fighting for four days. Most of the fighting occurred in four locations. Beach Creek, Blair Mountain, Crooked Creek, and Mill Creek. Governor Morgan became increasingly desperate in his pleas for federal support. However, it wasn't until September 2nd that his pleas were answered. Upon the arrival of federal troops, the miners were enthusiastic, assuming the troops would support them. They even met with the supposed rebel leader, Bill Blizzard. However, the troops did not take sides and with the somewhat grudging help of Blizzard, convinced the miners to lay down their arms. Casualty figures have no clear number, with estimates between 60 and 130 dead. As the strike ended, the coal companies began to pursue their true objective, crushing the Union by any means necessary. The first theater of this new battle took place in the courts, with the companies attempting to abolish the leadership within the Union by accusing 24 prominent UMWA leaders of treason, painting them as communists, in a reasonably successful attempt to turn the public against them. The coal companies also attempted to crush the Union financially, filing a lawsuit demanding a million dollars in damages incurred by a Union strike three years earlier in 1919. This and other lawsuits, like the 1922 Bill Blizzard treason trial, the cost of which ran at $1,000 to $2,000 per day, were severely taxing on the Treasury of District 17, especially since the UMWA was still paying unemployment stipends to three-fourths of the remaining Union members. Further harming the Union fiscally was the fact that in 1925, as the Union began to collapse, Lewis had committed much of the organization's remaining resources into a futile struggle to retain the northern West Virginia coalfields for the Union. This would become important later, because unfortunately for Lewis, the four states of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Kentucky produced about 70% of the United States soft coal and in all but Illinois, the Union would be shattered by the end of 1925. Both Kentucky and West Virginia were part of District 17 at the time, so the financial destruction wrought upon the Union in the courts extended to Kentucky. Coupled with the fact that non-Union mines could meet the demand for soft coal and do so cheaper, left Lewis with little to no leverage for negotiating wage gains. This would aggravate tensions about nationalization between Lewis and more radical UMWA leaders during the 1922 national strike, when Lewis only managed to maintain the present wage rates. A major success when one takes note of the coal industry's continuing collapse. As a result, District 17 lost leadership with Keeney and Mooney being forced out by Lewis as he attempted to consolidate power by pushing out his radical rivals. This consolidation of power was also a result of Lewis's failed bid for presidency of the AFL a year earlier against Samuel Gompers. This consolidation damaged the Union's organizing capability, especially in places like West Virginia where radical leaders were the best organizers, and when coupled with the financial destruction wrought by numerous lawsuits caused West Virginia membership to drop from 75,000 to 10,000, a trend repeated on a national scale with the UMWA losing over 125,000 members by 1927. After removing Keeney and Mooney, Lewis put District 17 on probation and appointed Van Bittner as the district head. However, evidence suggests that Van Bittner was an ineffective organizer due to his air of superiority and that any gains in membership after the National Industrial Recovery Act in 1933 were made thanks to the District 17 vice president and later president, Bill Blizzard, who because of the battle presented a more radical side of the UMWA. The revolution of Blair ultimately resulted in a series of crippling blows which not only damaged District 17 but also the UMWA as a whole thanks to the swift and merciless reaction of the operators, destroying the Union's leadership, organizing capability, and decimating the Union's treasury, all through the courts. The Union struggle continues today, although the battlefield has shifted to Wisconsin where Governor Scott Walker passed a bill stripping public employee unions of most collective bargaining rights. Fortunately, a Wisconsin judge has temporarily blocked the law. However, Governor Walker survived the recall election and remains in office. The battle ultimately paved the way for negative reforms within the Union, causing power vacuums, further loss of organizing capability, and political unrest. Without the protection implemented in NERA, and later the Wagner Act, the revolution of Blair Mountain would have destroyed the Union, the very thing that these miners fought so hard to preserve. 16 tons.
what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. 